the difference between TV and the digital age is that the TV people did not have your data and had to broadcast to, you know, a million TVs got the same thing, whereas YouTube can go, aha, that's your weakness. Let me give you more of that. Hello, welcome to Ezra Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. I am Ezra Klein. Uh, this is my show. <laughs> and I'm excited about the episode today. I know I always say that, but this is hitting right at the heart of some issues that I've come to think are pretty profound or are, are more at the center of things than even we realize. My guest today is Zainab Tufekce. She is at the University of North Carolina. She's at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. She's a New York Times columnist, and she is an unbelievably clear thinker about the intersection of technology and society. And, and the reason I wanted to have her on in particular right now with all the, the problems we're seeing for, for Facebook and, and Twitter, everything we're seeing in our elections, the, the news that there's more election manipulation being, being attempted on Facebook even as we speak. The reason I wanted to have her on right now is that she's been developing theories about how these platforms and the algorithms that run them radicalize us, about how the nature of censorship and distraction has changed in this era, about what free speech is online and what our attention is online, whether or not we control it or someone else controls it. It's some of the most clear theorizing about what we're living through of anybody I've seen. So I'm very excited about this conversation. I think it came out really well. Uh, there's a lot to chew on here. So it's worth giving some real attention to. <laughs> uh, that is a word that is going to come up a lot today. As always, you can email me, Ezra Klein Show at Vox.com. Again, Ezra Klein Show at Vox.com. I always appreciate your guest suggestions, feedback, whatever it may be. But here, without further ado, is our conversation. Zainab Tufekce, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. So I wanted to begin with YouTube. You wrote a piece for The New York Times a couple months ago arguing that YouTube, quote, may be one of the most powerful radicalizing instruments of the 21st century. Walk me through what you found there that, that made you think that. Sure. So if you've gone on YouTube, you know that it plays on sort of the right center um, of the screen, whatever you are wanting to Watch. I'm sorry, I'm on the left side. And on the right side, there's this recommended videos column. If you're on a mobile, it's below the main video and it auto plays them. So whatever you watch, you end up very quickly being served the next thing. So this is a very powerful tool because a lot of people will sit and watch what's next. Then you also sort of get to sort of scan the column and you can pick on something. So I started noticing, I, I knew that there was a lot of accusations that these columns would give you sort of more of what you wanted. They would pull you into filter bubbles or echo chambers, which is certainly a concern. But in the run up to the 2016 election, I noticed something else. They weren't just pulling you to what you already watched. So in my particular case. One of the most striking examples I noticed was when I started watching rallies of then-candidate Donald Trump. And I was watching them because I had attended some of the rallies and I was writing columns about it. And I was trying to argue that this wasn't a joke celebrity candidacy as it was taken at the time that he was a viable candidate, that he had struck a political course. I was kind of making that argument. And I, to quote him correctly, I ended up watching some rallies I had attended uh, in person. And my YouTube kind of lost it at that point is how I felt. Uh, after I watched the Trump rallies, I started getting really sort of disturbing suggestions. It was first sort of these mild, uh, do you know white people are at risk and white people are in danger kind of stuff that wasn't as bad as some of the later stuff. And it quickly descended into... YouTube recommending and autoplaying Holocaust denial videos, straight up Nazi stuff, really, really horrific stuff. And I thought, huh, you know, maybe there's some subsection of Donald Trump's political base that also watches these. This is a correlation. And YouTube has figured this out. Let me try to dig down and see what's happening. So I started doing other uh, videos first. Like I started, I would clean up my account. I would sometimes create new accounts. I would go to new computers and I would start watching other stuff. So I started watching stuff um, from the Democrat side. I watched Hillary Clinton videos or Bernie Sanders videos. And I quickly noticed 
I would then be served an autoplay, stuff that was slightly to the left of whatever I was watching. But then it wouldn't stop there, just like the other side. It would descend into kind of the zany conspiracy left. It's like, huh, maybe, you know, political people are into liking these kinds of more extreme theories, and this is what YouTube's doing. So I started watching non-political stuff, and I would start watching something about jogging and how to have jogging as a habit or how to run correctly. And YouTube would soon be like, how about an ultra marathon? I was like, how did I get here? I'm just trying to do this. I would watch a video about like being vegetarian. YouTube's like, you should be vegan. Here's a video about being vegan. So it was whatever you were watching. YouTube was that friend that always out edges you, right? Is whatever you do, they're more radical than you. They're more extreme than you. You, you had that friend at college or high school. You know, you will listen to heavy metal. They listen to trash metal. You know, if you're vegetarian, they're vegan. If you're vegan, they also don't eat honey. It just goes on like that. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so what was happening? And here's my best guess of what was happening is that YouTube's recommender algorithm, which Google had turned over to this, you know, artificial intelligence system, had figured out somehow that this kind of slightly edgier content is interesting. It's novel, right? It's not the same old, same old. If you're sort of watching something and you're shown more of it, you're like, thanks, I've had it. I I know what I watched and I'm done. Whereas if it's like, oh, look, peek behind the curtain. There's more here. That kind of edginess is quite attractive, especially to young people, right? So if you're watching something political and being told that there's even more extreme, more edgy content, and I don't mean radical in some healthy sense where there is questioning of assumptions or some sort of healthy uh, suspicion of authority or something like that. I just mean sometimes straight up crazy. You start watching Moon Landing and very soon you're being shown videos about how it never happened. So the algorithm had figured this out. This wasn't YouTube engineers deciding, oh, let's screw up the whole world and let's just create upheavals everywhere. And this was with English language content. But if it was doing it for English language content where it's easier for the engineers to see, most of them you know, are either based here or speak English, this is also happening after I started writing and talking about this and publishing about it, I've seen people have sent me lots of examples from places like Indonesia, from India, uh, from Brazil, from all over the world where if you are interested, say, you know, you're a devout youngster and you want to watch some content about Islam, well, soon you get suggested the ISIS kind of stuff. Or if you're sort of a little suspicious about Something you want to learn something more about a medical condition you have, you get suggested anti vaccination um, videos. So, this was very prevalent. And I know that people like you and me, right? We read, we read books, we have degrees, and we think of sort of the text as the main conduit of information. But if you look at young people today around the world, video has become a key conduit of information. A lot of journalists, a lot of people like me who are academics, people who are into reading and writing books kind of understate how important video is. There's even a lot of sites on YouTube that are making money by just having a machine read Wikipedia pages because kids are quite used to just watching or listening. And of course, add on to that the literacy issues. It's not always you know possible for everyone just to read stuff, in, especially in English. The video is the key conduit of information for billions of people. And YouTube is the key conduit for video. And here it is, wherever you start, it's trying to push you to the edge. And I was like, oh, what a disaster. What a horrific disaster. And I wrote this. And after I wrote this, I got flooded with examples. And it seems to be more prevalent that you get pushed to more Nazi and white supremacist stuff in the United States. But that's mainly a function of how much that side of the political spectrum has colonized and exploited YouTube. They have a lot of content and they push it all the time. So the algorithm pushes that all the time. This kind of works, as far as I can tell, across the political spectrum and across many countries. And so, yeah, here we are, you know, pushing edgier and edgier and more and more extreme content to billions of people. And um, just because they turned it over to an algorithm that 
and told it keep people on the site longer because that's their business model. So uh, I want to say I want to before we go further into this, I, I want to emphasize something you just said, which is if you're listening to this and you're saying, oh, YouTube, who cares? You are wrong. <laughs> I, I just want to say that flatly. You are wrong. Mm-hmm. YouTube is one of those platforms where the user behavior above age 30 and below age 30 are just completely different. Um, We see it in the statistics for where people spend time consuming Vox content. YouTube is by far one of our our biggest platforms in terms of the amount of minutes people spend with with our work. But when I go to college campuses, when I look at um, surveys of of how audiences are spending their time, a lot of people live in YouTube's world. Uh, I've come to wonder if it's not actually the most influential of all of the platforms. And this is even more so for the young, for whom YouTube really is television. Uh, it, it's just so much bigger, I think, than people realize because Absolutely. a lot of the other things like Facebook or Twitter, the user behavior scales up the age distribution. So people who edit websites and and whatever, they spend a lot of time on Facebook, but but often not on YouTube. But, but YouTube is really important. A lot of the future is being figured out there. And so with that in mind, The defense you hear of these algorithms is that in the end, we're the ones clicking. I I recognize there's an autoplay dimension to this, but but a lot of it is that recommended box and we are the ones clicking and we are also the ones training the algorithm. The algorithm wouldn't be coming to these views if it wasn't finding success in doing so. So the defense you get is that it's just giving us what we want. So doesn't the fault in the end lie with us, dear Brutus, not with our our platform managers? (laughs) So – Let's assume that it's giving us what we want. Uh, What we want when, right? What do you want in the moment? What do you want when you wake up in the morning? What do you want when you're hungry? What do you want when you're on your deathbed, right? What you want is not a simple thing. If you ask a lot of people how they wish they spent their free time, they would give you one answer. And if you ask them what they wish they wanted to eat, they would give you one answer. And their behavior very often diverges from that because we give in to temptation at times because we're human. We have vulnerabilities. What these algorithms have figured out how to exploit is those vulnerabilities. I think the best analogy here is the human appetite, right? The human appetite has evolved under conditions of hunger and scarcity. It's just in a few years that we will have more children who face obesity rather than more children who face hunger. This is the first time in human history where we're not as hungry. We've always been hungry. So you, we're evolved to crave sugary stuff. We're evolved to crave salt. We're evolved to crave fat. And that made a lot of sense, you know, in the Pleistocene, you're hanging around, there are no fridges, there are no supermarkets, and you get food once in a while. So you found it, you ate it. And if you didn't, you probably didn't leave a lot of ancestors behind. Perfectly reasonable behavior. So all of a sudden, you put a child who's been evolved, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years under these conditions with these cravings, and you put them in a cafeteria, and you know they have this temptation because it's part of their biology, and then you give them candy, potato chips, candy, potato chips, candy, potato chips, one after the other. The tray just keeps giving you the next one. You finish one bag of chips, you get another one. And the way appetite works is quite similar to the way the information works is that you seek more and more, right? If you eat a lot of salty food, it doesn't taste as salty. And if you don't eat a lot of salt, even a little bit of salt starts tasting salty. So what we're doing basically is saying, okay, fine, there's a human vulnerability, which is to seek stuff that seems more novel and edgier. And then an algorithm exploiting that to make money at the scale of billions. I don't think we would let that be. I mean, it's true that in the moment there's a person standing in front of it, but we owe it to ourselves to say, how do we design our systems so that they help us be our better selves rather than constantly tempt us with things that if we were sat down and asked, we probably would say that's not what we want, let alone exposing hundreds of millions of children to this, right? I think that's the biggest concern is that a lot of times when I see something and I'm just rolling my eyes, but I work with um, young populations all the time, a 12 or a 15-year-old, they may be quasi-adults in some ways, but they're not really equipped to deal with the full force of this play on their vulnerabilities. They're new to the world. They don't have the full information. And we're just sort of serving them chips and candy and chips and candy and chips and candy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then 
saying, oh, well, that's what they want. I don't think that's a good defense. <laughs> and on the practical side, not only is that not a good defense, if the whole world burns down because we have polarized and made everything more extreme, this is not good for anybody, including Google's business. This is, I, I think, to push ourselves down this path just to sell a little bit more detergent and this and that, because that's why we're doing it, right? It's just serving some ads. I find that quite indefensible. And it doesn't have to be that way. The, you know, th there's a lot of demand for video. There are a lot of videos. We can have a way in which we s try to make things slightly healthier, the way we try to make cars safer or the way we try to, and fail often, but we try to make our eating habits healthier and we try to nudge people to exercise, right? We should not try to nudge people to become ISIS sympathizers just because YouTube is making money off that. That seems pretty straightforward to me. One of the things you said that I think is so important, so I want to draw it out for a minute. We, we talk a lot about the ways in which we change and train the algorithms and people understand that argument. We don't talk nearly enough, in my view, about what you were just saying, which is the ways that the algorithms change and train us. That as we get used to politics sounding a certain way, as we get embedded in conspiracy theories or extreme segments or whatever it might be, that what we want changes as well, that we are shaped by our environments too. We're not static. Our preferences aren't static. Our revealed preferences don't stay the same. And as you bring people down this conveyor belt of radicalization, they are going down a conveyor belt. And so then they're pushing the algorithm in a, in a certain direction. It's a very dynamic system in a way that I feel that we have a lot of trouble talking about. Let, let me ask you, are you a Neil Postman fan? Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm definitely, as far as this, the scholarship goes, he identified a lot of the things we talk about in terms of TV, uh, where obviously you started seeing a lot of these trends before. You know, his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, is kind of a seminal work of scholarship. And his point was like amusement and entertainment if you just sort of gear your whole public sphere and your information flows towards amusing and entertaining people, it's not going to go down a healthy path. And he was absolutely correct. The difference between TV and the digital age is that the TV people wanted to do this. They wanted to tailor everything as narrowly as possible and capture you there, whereas the digital people have your data and can serve you screen by screen, whereas the TV people did not have your data and had to broadcast to, you know, a million TVs got the same thing, whereas YouTube can go, aha, uh -huh, that's your weakness. Let me give you more of that and go, aha, uh -huh, that's your weakness to the other person and do it at the scale of billions. So the impulses we're talking about, like the advertisers trying to sort of push your vulnerabilities, the politicians trying to nudge you, um, trying to sell you stuff. Those impulses and the vulnerabilities that they're evoking are, you know, part of modernity and our vulnerabilities are part of our, you know, human condition. The thing is that we now have technology that can effectively and cheaply exploit it at the scale of billions. So the claim here isn't that, oh, this is t completely novel. The claim here. We couldn't do this. You know, they were fighting a war with sticks and stones. And they could only do so much damage. And all of a sudden, nuclear weapons have been designed and they're working. So we have to say, OK, how do we deal with a world where these tools are powerful and working this way and are also scaling up, you know, to billions of people? If you were to guess, where would you say your brain stacks up against other people your age? Do you think your memory or your attention is above average? It is important to know this. It is important to know if your brain, your memory is better than other people who are like you. And using Lumosity, you can find out. Lumosity is the world's most popular brain training program. So it isn't just that you can test yourself, it's that you can improve yourself. Uh, you can't see the results in a mirror or on a bathroom scale, but if you wanna keep your brain fit, you've got to treat it like a muscle. You've got to train it. You can sign up for Lumosity and take the free 10-minute fit test to get your baseline scores on three games and see how you stack up against others of your age. And then the actual training, the honing of your brain, the turning it into Batman begins. With Lumosity Premium, they even design a personalized training program from their 60-plus cognitive games and activities to challenge your key abilities like memory, speed, and problem solving. With every game, they keep track of your progress and they show how you compare it worldwide. 
And at the very least, don't you want to know how you stack up to others? Isn't that little bit of competitive spirit in you fired up? Uh, you can find out right now. You go to lumosity.com slash E-Z-R-A. That is L-U-M-O-S-I-T-Y dot com slash E-Z-R-A to sign up for the free fit test plus a 30% discount off Lumosity Premium. Again, that is lumosity, L-U-M-O-S-I-T-Y dot com slash E-Z-R-A to get your free fit test and 30% off Lumosity Premium. Lumosity.com slash E-Z-R-A. So I'm late to the the Neil Postman party on this. I just have started going through his work in the last couple of months. But but you bring up Amusing Ourselves to Death, which if you have not read it, I highly, highly recommend it. One of the big points of that book, and it's a point that you echo in in your book on Twitter and and network protest, is that different communication mediums change us. An oral culture makes us better at memorization. A typographical culture makes us better at logical argument. A televised and visual culture makes us expect things will be appealingly visually packaged and, and, and in his argument makes us expect that everything will eventually take the form of entertainment. One of the things I've wondered is – for those of us who spend so much time on, on Twitter, on Facebook, on, on social media, on algorithmic social media, how do you think that's changing us? How do you think it's changing what our brains are good at, what identities we call forth? I mean, if Neil Postman were writing the book today, what would be this sort of one or two line description of what living in a, a top social media platforms is doing to the way we see the world? I'm not going to be good with the punchy one, two line description, but um, like let's just walk through the argument you made, I think, because it's an important one. And part of it, this oral culture is a, is a good example. It comes from um, one scholar I recommend there is Walter Ung, uh, who wrote a lot about this. If you have nothing to write things on, obviously, people with good memory, and if you have no writing technology, people with good memory are going to be prized, right? So in the social media age, the quantity that's scarce that we're all competing for is attention, right? Um, this goes back to Hermit Simon's, I believe, 1973 insight in that in an age where there's too much information, the thing that is scarce is the thing that information consumes, which is attention. So attention grabbing, attention attraction becomes this very well-rewarded thing. And if you do it right, and if, especially if you kind of do it right in a way that melds with the algorithm – you will be rewarded by the society. Hence, I know a lot of people sort of sneer at the Kardashian enterprise, but that is, um, that's a skill, right? They've Absolutely. been in front of camera. That's just a skill. They've been in front of cameras for a very long time and managed to get attention and control it and direct it. And when they want to keep something secret, they do manage to keep it secret, which is this really tough management business skills and, you know, do whatever. They're not doing something extraordinary besides that. And our current president has almost an instinctual understanding for it. And I, w- I usually describe him as an ex-reality TV star because that's the profession that he most excelled at. And um, politics is also very much related to the ability to get attention. If you're a social movement, if you're a politician, if you can't get attention to you, if you are a movement that's trying to change and if you can't focus public's attention on what you're concerned about, you're going to get nowhere. So one of the things the current social media age does where there's so much content competing with algorithms is that it rewards attention gathering. And then we sort of become better at it. I have so many times, I mean, I ended up, quirks of, you know, history and stuff, I ended up with a fairly large profile on social media. I, um, and during the past few years, I have increasingly found myself fighting the temptation to tweet things and sitting on my hands and not tweeting it. And the things I hold back are things that I know would get attention, things that I know would be popular. Um, and it's fun. It's tempting. I, I yep. want to sort of slam something and get into it. I'm an opinionated person. I like arguing and I want to do it um, and because the system rewards it. The way social media is set up, the way Twitter is set up, the way the human psychology is set up, it really rewards it. And then I think, wait, you know what? This isn't going to work well because it's going to be misunderstood. And then I try, I close my eyes and I try to imagine the size of the audience. I sometimes check the stats and I, I have like 300,000 something followers and that might mean 100,000 people at any time might see something. If something gets retweets, 
I don't know how many are real, but it could be a million uh, more people. And I'm like, would I really shout this in a in front of a million people? And then I hold myself back, right? So the way it's set up, it's hiding the true audience. It's hiding where it could go. And even if you have like 50 followers, something you tweet could just get out of hand and could be retweeted by somebody with a high follower number, and you would all of a sudden find yourself quoted in the New York Times or CNN, right? So you don't have this control over where it goes. But when you're sitting down, you're sitting down with your phone, it seems like this tiny little thing, and it rewards the things that would get all that attention. Um, So I think if we had the 21st century version of what is this media training us to do, it's training us to grab attention. It's training us to make a play for attention. And it's rewarding attention with political power. It's rewarding attention with money, especially if you can align that attention grabbing with the algorithms uh, online. There are people, I show this to my class every semester, to my bright college students uh, who are working hard and studying hard and who do great things, I show them these unwrapping videos on YouTube where a lady with painted fingernails unwraps Disney stuff. And I think she makes four or five million dollars a year from a rough calculation. You don't even see her face. She's just unwrapping toys and saying, oh, look, this is what's in it. That's what in it. That's it. She just got there first. And it's this feedback cycle. If you're kind of there early on, you get an audience, the algorithm recommends you, you do it right, you feed it enough. So this is what I think we're being trained to do. So my current thing is just the way, you know, sometimes you pass on some food because it's not healthy. It's the way you exercise because your job is so sedentary. Otherwise, I think, how do I fight the sort of the pull of attention because that's what everything around me is pulling me towards. But that's a personal thing. If you're a social movement, or if you're a politician, you have to be thinking, how do I get that attention and how do I control it? And how do I keep it from consuming me? Consuming me? How do I make it so that I am not a tool of the attention that I try to direct? It's this nightmare, difficult, challenging thing because attention, even though it's kind of understudied, is central to human societies because we are group animals. We are not individual animals. We, what we pay attention to as a group is absolutely consequential and important. I love the way you put a lot of that. I, there are a bunch of places I want to take this because I, I've really come to believe that attention is one of the truly key words of our age, and it's one that we don't know how to talk about all that well. But before we get there, I, I want to describe something that, that you were talking about maybe from a from a different angle within the media, which is I think something people underrate in terms of how much it has changed us and changed how we relate to one another is how much more competitive the media and attention spaces have become. You go back not that long, 20, 30 years. Um, you're writing in a newspaper. There are a couple other newspapers in town, but probably mm-hmm. you have a subscription. So there's some lock-in among your audience already. There are way fewer channels. There's no Twitter. There's no Facebook. But all, all these things that we now take for granted where there's just millions of things competing for your attention and your eyeballs at any given moment. They're not like that. And one of the things that seems to me to be driving a lot of this on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, wherever you want to go, is that the space has gotten so crowded. If you're on Twitter, there are so many people tweeting it every single second. If you're on Facebook, there is so much more content coming into your newsfeed in theory than your newsfeed is actually able to show you that we've gotten into a real incredibly competitive attention space. And now it seems to me that what is happening is we're finding out, well, what really wins in a true competitive attention space? What really wins when dozens, hundreds, thousands of things are competing for your attention in a given moment? And the answers are, among other things, the things that outrage or excite your core identities, the things that are really funny or really mean or really shocking. Mm -hmm. Um, Donald Trump talks in a way, tweets in a way previous politicians have not, for the most part, spoken or tweeted. And that works because he gets coverage they didn't get. The kind of crazy things he says gets much more coverage than the planned, careful things that a Barack Obama or George W. Bush said or or pumped out. And we are taught, I think, in our society to believe that competition is always and everywhere a good thing. 
that if you have a more competitive market, you're going to have a more efficient market. And I don't know what to do about this because it's not like I think you should be reconstructing media monopolies. But I think something we're seeing is that a world with this much competition to be heard in it means you have to go in some directions that are not great. And the more we are training everybody who is successful in media to be trying to win this unbelievable war for people's attention with everything else shouting at the same time, then the more algorithms are rewarding whatever does win the war. It becomes very easy to see why so much falls along identity levels, why so much falls along um, the sort of escalator of radicalization and extremism, why so much is so mean, um, and also why so much is so funny and just why so much is so shocking. Competition to me seems to be an underrated force in all this. Again, competition that is geared towards your vulnerabilities. The, the way you describe like what gets attention, the stuff that's outrageous, the stuff that's exciting, and the stuff that's kind of likable and cuddly, that's basically your Facebook newsfeed, right? Like if you go on Facebook, uh, mine is a combination of you know, people who have some trouble and they're seeking help or they want support. So it's sort of sad stuff or lots of babies, engagement, marriages, cuddly stuff or stuff that's really things that my people on Facebook find outrageous, right? So it's just kind of, there's not a lot of the mundane because, well, the mundane is boring. I mean, it's even a joke, right? Why are you tweeting your lunch? Well, because it gets boring, right? So the algorithm's like, all right, let's not show each other people uh, their lunch unless it's an exciting lunch, right? So the algorithms have figured out that the mundane, we don't look again because that's the whole point of it. It just seeds into the background. And what you're describing is that all this content trying to scream at you from the background and saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, the way that the ice cream aisle is screaming at you and saying, pick me, eat me, eat me, right? It's kind of the same kind of dynamic there. It's a human vulnerability, and we have monetized competing to exploit that human vulnerability. And what we instead need to do, and I'm not going to have some simple answer because every age requires new kinds of ways of dealing with it, is this combination of education clearly. I mean, educate the people comes up a lot. And I, hey, I'm an academic, right? That's my business model. So it sounds good to me. But that's not something you can just quickly educate your way out of it, right? It'll, it will take generations to adjust to what's going on. So education is part of it. Creating labels, like nutritional labels, like the fact-checking stuff, that's clearly part of it, right? I think those are valuable. But a huge part of what we obviously need to do is to find ways to make that supply more in line with what we want in the long term. I don't mean that we go back to a model where we patronize people and tell them, this is what's good for you, eat your broccoli, right? That's just not going to work anyway. The genie's out of the bag. This is not going to work in the 21st century. But we can, as a society, decide this isn't what we want. You might be able to tempt me with that piece of junk food when I'm hungry. But what is a better way to do this is to set up a world in which that when you're hungry, we are first served a nutritious food because that's what we ask for when we sat down and said, what should my cafeteria give me? I should be able to say, you know, when I'm hungry, don't just push ice cream and potato chips in front of my nose. First, you know, give me some healthy filling food and that's tasty as well. And we have to produce that kind of stuff and we have to teach people, especially young people. And I find more and more discernment among young people because they're kind of growing up in this environment and they're they sense it uh, in some ways because they're native to it compared to someone who grew up with the TV environment, right? So you have to do all these things so that our choices are better structured. I, I think like the, with the thing with the competition thing is I think the every IT company, every digital platform, every technology company absolutely knows the power of the default. If you set the default to one thing, like 90, 95% of the people will never touch it. If you set it to the opposite, 90, 95% of the people will never touch it, right? So the answer to the question, what do people want, isn't one or the other based on the fact that they won't touch the default because they won't touch it either way. Most of the time, and this might be a little humbling for people to admit, but I think it's an important thing to admit, both at the personal level and at the social level, is that 
we go with the structure. We go with the options in front of us, the way we set up our lives, the way we set up our kitchens, the way we set up our cities, the way we set those things up, really have a lot of influence on the choices we make. That's not saying we're automatons and somebody's just looking into our eyes and hypnotizing us. It's just just admitting that there is this tension between our own agency in the world and the choices and options we're offered. So to step back and say, we're now going to use our agency at a meta level and say, we're going to structure things better. And if you look at sort of, to give another example, if you look at cities or architecture, if you make a walkable city, people will walk more and they'll be healthier. If you make a city where you have to drive everywhere, people will drive everywhere and they're not going to spend as much time in the gym. You need to make walking and biking kind of this natural thing people do and set things up for it. And then people will do more. So I think that's what we need. We need to take the choice discussion away from just discussing at choice in the moment you're vulnerable and facing an asymmetric situation where the company knows everything about you and is trying to exploit you and say, no, let's put the choice to the societal level and say, what do we as a society want to do? And this is why a lot of this comes back to politics. These are not decisions for Mark Zuckerberg to make alone. These are not decisions for, you know, Sergey Brin or Larry Page to make alone. I mean, they could be the nicest people on the planet. They could make all the decisions I personally agree with or not. It still wouldn't be right for a few companies or a few individuals to say, this is what we as a society should see. And we need to have this tough political discussion on what are the rules and what are the structures under which we have a healthier society. Hiring is hard. It takes time and it is at its core an information problem. You've got a job. You've got a job listing. You've got a resume and application process. But you don't know who it is who'd be the perfect fit and the perfect fit may not know you have a job. And that's where ZipRecruiter comes in. What ZipRecruiter is trying to do is solve that information problem on both sides. The way they do it is ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. They have this powerful matching technology where they scan thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and actually invite them to apply to your job. So they're not just going out and waiting for someone to find it. They are going out and finding the people and telling them about it. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights top candidates so you never miss a great match. They are so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. If you have done much hiring, you know how rare that is. With results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address. It's ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. Again, ZipRecruiter.com slash EZRA. ZipRecruiter.com slash, wait for it, EZRA. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. It's always been strange to me that given how much capability the different companies here give us to train the algorithms that we rely on, they never give us abilities to set or shape them. It would not be that difficult to set up some kind of slider on the back end where it's like you can bring up the amount of news you want to see or you can bring it down. You can bring up how much you want to see that is on your side of the aisle or you can bring it down. I mean, you could give people quite a bit of choice and it wouldn't by any means be an incredibly difficult technological problem to – increase the volatility of what they're seeing. And yet they don't do that. The degree to which the algorithm is not only proprietary, but like we're, we are told to keep our grubby hands off of it. I mean, a lot of people wanted this from Twitter, right. right? I remember when Twitter went algorithmic, which has clearly been a good thing for the company from a company perspective. But it would not have been that difficult to give people the choice to not go that algorithmic or to give it the choice to go only you know half as algorithmic as they wanted to go and show more stuff out of the just normal timeline. And when these things are there, they're made very hard to get to. And in general, they're just not there. It's a fascinating thing to me because we talk so much about how these technologies can give us so much control. And we talk so much about how they're learning from us. And yet we're given no control over them. And we're given so little power over them. I, I think even about my own Spotify Discover. And I love Spotify Discover. 
But Spotify Discover is 100% sure and always is that the only thing I like is pretty sad ambient electronica. (laughs) And I'm not saying I don't like pretty sad ambient electronica. Like I'm an emo kid all growing up. It's all it's all fair enough. Uh, But I would like to tell it that, you know, like some weeks I would like to be discovering in this other space. Right. And whatever, they have other products and I can find playlists. I'm not here to to shit on Spotify, but it's just odd. They're using us to train the algorithms, Mm -hmm. but they don't trust us to, to use your great term here, to to meta shape the algorithms. There's no ability to to step like above what my preferences are in the moment and give the thing some forward guidance. Right. So you want the forward guidance and you also could have a world in which the defaults, right? You could have a world in which the defaults are news from actual news sources rather than fake stuff, right? right? And then if somebody really wants to go see the fake stuff, I am pretty wary of banning stuff short of certain things. Um, and we can talk about this. If somebody really, really wants to go and like type the name in and is going to seek it out and just read it, I'm kind of like, it's not our place to tell them they cannot read it. But... You can make it so that they have to actually go seek it rather than pushing it and pushing it and pushing it because it's exciting and it gets you clicks and um, it just sort of feeds onto itself. So you don't get that choice. The other things that you don't get is that like when you go on, say, Spotify, which I used to and I use this Discover and I have the same problem is that it just like I listen to some stuff and it sticks me in that corner. The same problem with Facebook. If I comment on a few friends, it just sticks me on that corner and then shows me their stuff again and again and again. So the problem there is if I told Spotify, surprise me, it almost certainly would create moments where I would feel uncomfortable and turn it off because it would surprise me with stuff I do not like. But the nature of discovery is that you sit through some stuff you don't like if you are going to find stuff that you surprisingly like, right? There's no other way to just sort of read your mind and find exactly what would surprise you and you would like rather than going through that. And there's that space of being uncomfortable with where you are. Now I'm going to sort of make this grand social pronouncement, which I don't really like doing, but I think we have built our society to try to minimize that. Our business models, our personal things, like that sort of sitting with discomfort is not something that we're taught to appreciate as a path to future good stuff. We see it sometimes, like in um, some exercise cultures kind of have that, but they kind of exaggerate it, feel the burn kind of stuff. But that discomfort very often is a prelude to discovery. And if the business model is set on in the moment kind of thing, they don't want you to do that. So I, I mean, I can imagine games in which the algorithm says, all right, I'm going to surprise you and we're going to do the surprise thing, but you're going to sort of listen to five songs and you commit to it. I mean, it's like nobody's making you, right? You could obviously turn it off, but it's just a way of recognizing that surprise me comes with discomfort and it could say, this is not all going to be stuff you like. Are you sure? And you could be like, I realize that. And it'll be like, here's five songs and you're not going to like them and we're not going to let you skip until you're halfway through the song or something like that. And again, this is all voluntary. I mean, this isn't nobody's holding a gun to your head. So there are ways in which we could structure this. And if somebody structured it like that and said, I'm not going to let you skip until half the song, but I'm going to surprise you. I would try that at least once or twice a week. Um, because it would sometimes work. But if somebody said you can skip immediately, I would skip immediately, right? So this is just recognition that you are a person. My school gym, my university gym, when I was a grad student, um, had this thing where if you stop pedaling or running, the sound in the TV you were watching would go off, right? If you stop pedaling, it would just go off. And I didn't have a TV at home. And I, if I want to watch a movie or the you know political debates or something like that, I'd have to go to the gym. I mean, I remember- This is the healthiest thing I've ever heard. I have. I remember like being on uh, an elliptical or treadmill for two hours. I would just watch the movie because the sound would go off. Now, of course, I could set up a world in which you know I would buy the TV. I could have it at home, all of that. But it really worked for me. I was like, you know- doing two-hour things, and it was just great. And this, 
you could still see it. There were still the captions. I was like, oh, wait, I'm not running. So we need to have this way in which we have these social discussions on how do we sit with discomfort? And then we structure our lives and say, how do we do this? And this you can apply this to lots of things, right? Uh, I live within biking distance to my work, but it's clearly quicker to drive, right? I can drive in five minutes what I can bike in 20 minutes. And the way I've handled it with myself is I have not purchased a parking pass for my university. So I don't have the choice to drive to work. I have to bike to work, otherwise it's a hassle. Now I made this myself, right? And in a pinch, I could grab a cab or something, I could take the bus, but I made a conscious meta decision to try to make myself bike more rather than drive more. But if I hadn't made that decision, if I had that parking pass in front of me, I am telling you, 7 a.m., I am going to drive uh, a lot of times. So the recognition that we're human, that we have vulnerabilities, that we respond to things in front of us, that if we're hungry, we reach for junk food, that if we're kind of bored, we just go for mindless entertainment. All of those things, like recognizing human vulnerabilities, I think is important in realizing that it's not okay to exploit them for whatever profit you make and that we want to do better. And that's the conversation that it's not just technical, it's not just political, it's just this general thing. Let's set up the world so that we can be our better selves as we define it when we are thinking deliberately and at length about it rather than something constantly blinking us at us and saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, eat me, do this, do that. It's this big shift we need now that we have digital technology. With all the news about the Supreme Court right now, it is incredibly helpful to know the history behind this institution that is wielding such extraordinary influence over our daily lives and shaping so much of our politics. And The Great Courses Plus, they've got an excellent course on this. It is named, quite aptly, History of the Supreme Court. And the way it works, it's a deep dive, not only into the cases that have shaped the country over the past 200 years, but the quite personal nature of, of these key decisions and the justices behind them. I mean, when we're watching these nomination processes, it's easy to forget that these are human beings being nominated and which human being gets nominated. Well, a, a lot in American life has turned on that. And, and so understanding how that played out in the past, it's at least helpful for contextualizing what's going to happen in our future. But if that's not your speed, you can listen to anything from The Great Courses Plus. They've got thousands of lectures, and with The Great Courses Plus, you get unlimited access to all of it. You can stream their entire library of learning really about anything from top experts in history, politics, economics, human behavior, science, new languages, cooking, photography. I've heard from you. I've seen the photographs of some of you who have taken the photography course. They're beautiful photographs. It's a great space to just learn about whatever is interesting you at the moment. You can watch or listen anytime with the Great Courses Plus app. And for a limited time only, my listeners can enjoy the Great Courses Plus free for an entire month. But to get this special offer, you need to sign up right now for the special URL, which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash EZRA. Again, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash EZRA. So let's talk about the the recognition that we're human, because even if we are not always recognizing this all that well, <laughs> other others are. I've always thought it's really telling when USA Today did a big analysis of what Russia's social media pages were doing in 2016. It's that they were spreading discord about race in America. The, the, the Russians looked at us and they said, aha, I know how to get them really upset. I know how to suppress a vote. I know how to get people at each other's throats. And that's to dig into the American cleavages on race. And then, you know, just a couple of days ago, there was a New York Times report that Facebook has discovered more coordinated activity uh, on the platform. They're not sure who it's by yet. It's not clear if it's Russia or not. But it's around the Unite the Right white supremacist rally and whether or not there's going to be a sequel to it. It's around the Abolish ICE hashtag, which has become bigger on the left and is about uh, changing the way immigration enforcement works within the country. I'm curious what you hear or what you see when you see outside actors focusing on these issues. What are they understanding about us that maybe we or the platforms are less willing to admit? Right. So a couple of things here. I just want to be clear. I think the Russian meddling, as it's come to be called, was pretty visible and obvious before the election. Uh, since I was following the stuff, it was kind of staring you in the face. So we've since had a lot of explanations and disclosure from Facebook. We had an indictment. So we have a lot more information. 
But there has been enough open, in front of your face, visible stuff that, I mean, I think at this point, it's kind of hard to deny that there was a concerted effort and it reached some amount of the population. So I, I, that's one thing. But the other thing is um, the Russian meddling to the degree it worked. And I, I was following all this before the election too. It piggybacked on existing trends, existing polarizations, existing efforts, some of them ideologically driven, some of them just for profit because it's a great way to make money, right? If you just sort of create stuff that gets hate clicks even, um, that just works. Uh, it's a very, very lucrative business. So what they did, as far as I can tell, was actually not the super sophisticated thing. It was a clumsy thing. They realized that race is a cleavage uh, in this country because, I mean, it's so obvious, right? If you know one thing about the United States, that's probably on your top three. Uh, but they didn't understand a lot of things. They were just playing around. Like they tried to push Texas secessionism and California secessionism. And if you think about it, that's because they're Russian. And in that part of the world, like Crimea or Ukraine, that's a real thing. Uh, whereas in the United States, that's not a big thing, but they didn't understand. They were just pushing it. But what happens when you're on social media is that you do not have to be great at it. You just need to look at the digital analytics, right? So what they seem to have done, as far as I can tell, is push a bunch of things. And it's kind of clumsy across the board effort uh, at things they thought were cleavages, secessionism, race, Bernie Sanders versus Hillary. They just pushed and pushed and pushed. And then just looked at their dashboard, and it was pretty clear what worked. Uh, so before the election, we had um, actually I talked to this guy after the election. One of the big pages, the uh, was it the Denver Guardian, it was a fake newspaper, it was pumping out really vicious anti-Hillary Clinton stuff. It was just horrible, vicious stuff, and it was getting just viral on Facebook. And I talked to the creator of that page, and he's a liberal guy from California. I'm like, why did you do this and not the other? It's like, this is what got clicks. <laughs> and it made him good money. He worked a couple hours from his couch and made hundreds of thousands of dollars. So some of the things that we have seen are product of the feedback cycle between being able to try lots of things and immediately see what works. So you don't have to be a genius at understanding the U.S. society. You just have to try a bunch of things and then look at your Facebook analytics and it will work. And if you look sort of, uh, forget the Russia part and look at how the campaigns did on Facebook, Donald Trump's campaign spent a lot more money on Facebook. And as far as I can tell, compared to Hillary Clinton's campaign, they also turned a lot of things over to Facebook. And Facebook offered this to both campaigns and Donald Trump's campaign took them up with what's called embeds, right? There are people, Facebook employees that went and said, here's how you use our platform best. And they did. And they tested tons of things and they were very sort of um, good at responding to the analytics. They were like, okay, this works. Let's push this more. When I went to uh, Donald Trump's rallies, one of the things I really noticed was that some of the things that appear rambling, like he's talking, and sometimes people will take that talk, speech, and transcribe it and then laugh at it because it's really rambly. Uh, and you see this a lot on Twitter, journalists laughing at these rambling paragraphs of him. What's actually happening is that he uses the rally as a form of analytics. He's just starts somewhere and the audience energy isn't there. He just switches mid-sentence. And if the audience energy isn't there, he switches again and then finds something. So it's this really interesting combination of you know using the rallies to test your messages, using digital analytics to test your messages. You already know what kind of works. And then you have all these other actors, not legitimate actors like foreign powers who are using the same methods just digitally test your message. And you have people doing it for money, the famous Macedonian teenagers testing your message. So I think that's what's happening is that since social media rewards the ability to gather audiences and since outrage or just sort of stuff that gets you angry, was really good at it. And since you can test lots of things and find that what works, 
people find what works. And that's how the cleavages get used rather than a bunch of Russians who've studied U.S. for their whole life and they're just experts at it. I, I don't think that's right. what happened no, at I, all. I, I, I take your point on that. One of the things I wanted to ask you about that, though, is, is you've written something that's been in my head for a little while. It was a couple months ago, but you wrote that the most effective forms of censorship today involve meddling with trust and attention, not muzzling speech itself. As a result, they don't look much like the old forms of censorship at all. They look like viral or coordinated harassment campaigns, and they look like epidemics of disinformation meant to undercut the credibility of valid information sources. I've been thinking a lot about this because on the one hand, for the thing that we're describing and talking about, this this information overload, this like denial of service attack on our ability to pay attention to things, is censorship really the right word? And then on the other, something I do notice is that what people are really asking for as a remedy is for Facebook or YouTube or Twitter to practice genuine censorship, to kick people off of the platform, to suspend their accounts. Like, How do you deal with this world where the thing that we have been taught to be afraid of are Orwellian-like structures of, of censorship, of silencing, of, of fascism. And what we're dealing with are, are sort of attention overload structures. Right. And then the remedies people go to then allow folks to wrap themselves to some degree with, with validity in the garments of free speech, in the garments of free exchange, of open debate. I mean, you, you're in a very weird place where Alex Jones is w- able to cry out that he's being censored and there is some validity to that. And on the other hand, Nobody has set up a structure under which there is like a clear answer about what to do with him or even what to call him. It, it feels to me like our language is almost outdated for the reality of the world we're living in. Yep. The language is absolutely outdated. And if I could – I love George Orwell's work, but if I could ban 1984 from entering this discussion, I would try. I would be my – big sister and just ban it because I think it just really is misleading because it has this totalitarian exactly name. what he predicted yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go I have emerged as the big censor so I don't have a better word than censorship to describe what happened say with the WikiLeaks hacks in October of 2016 and it was a combination of mass media complacency and um, inability to understand what was happening and illegitimate political sabotage that somehow got presented at whistleblowing. And whistleblowing is a time-honored and honorable tradition, uncurated dumps of one side's political conversations and personal conversations a month before the election clearly is something else. And mass media was so into the sort of drip-drip part, they didn't do their job. There, There was a lot of things that needed to be reported on for both campaigns that weren't reported on. So I don't really have a way. I mean, it's kind of like that thing where you yell squirrel when something else is happening. We need that. Maybe this is called it the squirrel, right? It's squirreling. You're just distracting and overwhelming uh, what. Wait, that's a great, that's a, is that, did you just make that, uh, <laughs> that up make, on the spot? Yeah, that's I just very made good. it up. Yeah. So it's, it needs a word. Uh, this is what was happening. So on the other Side. The Facebooks and Google, especially through YouTube and search algorithm, have become the key gatekeepers through their algorithm and what they allow and what they don't. And I don't like this world. I really do not like this world that we have so few and it's just not great. But we are here and what they are allocating isn't necessarily speech, right? If Facebook kicked off InfoWars, InfoWars would still have its website. So its speech isn't necessarily denied. What it would be denied is attention and access to large networks. There's a joke, three degrees of Alex Jones. You can start anywhere on YouTube and you'll quickly get recommended Alex Jones. So what you're seeing from Facebook and Google isn't just allowing Alex Jones to be on the site, they've been helping amplify his message. So that's that one part of it is that they would be denying him attention. Should one company or two companies be allowed to deny so much attention? There's a problem there. And there's no denying that this kind of bottlenecking is a problem. And that's why we're all leaning on, we're all playing to the two referees, right? Facebook and YouTube, which isn't great to begin with. In his particular case with InfoWars, what the, the stuff they're doing is they're basically targeting people for potential incitement, violent incitement against them. I mean, the, the 
most obvious example is uh, claiming that parents who lost children at the Sandy Hook's um, school mass murder are just actors is inciting violence against them because you're saying these people, their children aren't real. I mean, the, besides the harassment and the horrific cruelty of it, it is effectively inciting violence against them because you're playing to, let's say, a very fond of their guns audience. A small portion of this country owns most of the guns and you're playing to that audience and you're telling them there are these people who are pretending to have lost children in order to have your guns taken away. So, and this is just one of the families, they wrote an open letter recently. They've been living in hiding because of this. To me, this crosses pretty much any line that I can decide. If I were operating a platform, I this is not the kind of stuff that is hard to decide on for me. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's really gray and that's difficult. And Facebook does a lot of, like, if you have a Beyonce track that's unauthorized, Facebook and YouTube will take it down in a snap. So to me, that case is an example where they're bending to political pressure. They're so afraid of being called biased. They're so... I, I want to ask you yeah. something about that political yeah. pressure, though, but before we move on from it, because I think it's super interesting. The point you're making that they're, they're not governments, they're gatekeepers. That's right. They've become so powerful that I think we don't even know how to look at them. So, so Ted Cruz had this very strange set of tweets where he was saying, well, on the one hand, I don't like Alex Jones because Alex Jones keeps suggesting my father helped kill John F. Kennedy right. Jr., which is true. That, that, that is what Alex Jones suggests. And, and so does Donald Trump. And the fact that Ted Cruz has decided to ally himself with all these people is a, a real interesting fact about where he sees his political incentives to be. But he would hashtag this stuff, you know, 1A. Right. He would say things like, who made these platforms the deciders of, of, of speech? And, you know, in any other context, Ted Cruz, defender of the free market, does not believe that private companies should be coerced right. to sell or permit whatever anybody wants on them. But he's acting now as if they're almost governments. And, and this to me do, seems to be the, the problem. They're too powerful for us to to have a, a way of talking about them. We keep wanting to look them as companies, but we also want to give them almost the responsibilities of governments. And then we also don't know what to do with how we regulate them. We, we just seem to be in a real pileup in what we expect of them. This is absolutely true because they have moved beyond companies for sure. They have become part of the public infrastructure of attention in the 21st century. There's no denying for me that Facebook is part of public infrastructure. There are so many civic things I do, absolutely civic, regular things that I have no access to besides Facebook groups. And uh, I have lots of people that I have no access to besides Facebook products. And I, I really don't. And this is not for lack of trying at times. So that's just the reality. If you're cut off from Facebook, if you're mistakenly or accidentally or unfairly cut off from Facebook, you are denied a part of the public sphere. And so when we say that they should stop helping Alex Jones, there's two parts of it. There's one is, does he get to exist on the platform? That's one set of questions. Does the recommender algorithm on Facebook and YouTube recommend this stuff? That's another set of questions, right? If somebody shares this, does Facebook highlight it or demote it? That's another thing that's sort of playing with the attention side. The third part is um, they've just taken down a bunch of, as you said, things that they identified with potentially as there's some sort of coordinated campaign, and they look very much like the previous Russian campaigns. But there's a rally that was supposed to happen in New York, and its page has been taken down, and they're crying and saying, we're real, we're real, right? They just got swept up. So the question is, what happens if there's a false positive, right? Even if we do want certain things to be taken down, let's say as a whole society, we agree that if a foreign government is pretending to be a Black Lives activist, we're going to cut it off. But what if there's a false positive? What's the process? This just can't happen like this. We definitely need forms of due process, forms of um, understanding and regulating and their market power is just too big to treat them either as corporations. But yes, you're right. They're not governments either. I know we've got to let you get to your next thing, but obviously we could talk about this stuff all day. But so I guess I'll, I'll end with the question we, we always ask on the show to, to close it out, which is we've been talking about social media platforms and digital publishers uh, the whole time. What are three books you would recommend that you've read that have influenced you that you think the, the audience should read as well? <laughs> Tough question. Okay, so... 
Let me say that there's an enormous number of great new books. Um, there's just a lot, so I couldn't pick three from the most recent crop. But I'm going to recommend three books that precede the current moment. One of them is um, something called The Control Revolution by James Benegar, Technological and Economic Origins of the Information Society, where he makes the argument that we developed information technology not as a means of efficiency or even information, but as a means of control. And there he's talking about production control. And I think there's a case to be made that increasingly our digital infrastructure is a form of social control. And you see in China how that could go, and you see how it could go here. So I find the sort of thinking of control and power rather than just information as to be a good way of understanding some of the ways this thing happens. Uh, so that's one book. Another book that got out in the early days of the internet is called Ruling the Waves. It's cycles of discovery from the compass to the internet. And it talks about how the early days of any new technology like this is first the upheaval and the rebels and the pirates. And then you look around and the pirates are employed by the British Navy to patrol the high seas. And all of a sudden, they're part of the empire. right? So that's kind of a very instructive book to anyone who thinks that technology will not be eventually taken up by power. And the final book I'm going to say is because we kind of touched upon this, uh, Walter Ong is a scholar who's written a lot about pre-literate cultures, like cultures where there's no writing. And I think it's really important because we are so steeped in a writing and literate culture, we don't really understand how big a shift it is to go from an oral culture to a literate culture. And then we went through parts of the literate culture, right? We went to uh, printing press and we went to the rest of it. And now we're in something else. And I don't really know what to call this something else. And I think it's a good grounded work in trying to think, how does our media shape us, right? How does the media we have and the tools we have to think with and to communicate with also shape us and what's value? So those would be three, all, you know, from 80s and 90s, so pre this digital explosion, but good sort of ways of thinking about the current moment. Zainab Tufekci, uh, thank you so much. This was incredibly, incredibly helpful. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much to Zainab. Thank you to my producer, Jillian Weinberger, my engineer, Victor Tanner. The Ezra Klein Show is a Vox Media podcast production, and we'll be back next week. Hi, I'm Kara Swisher. I want to tell you about another podcast you should check out. It's called Recode Decode. Every week, I talk to tech and media's key players about how they're changing the world. I interview tech execs like Apple CEO Tim Cook, political figures like Anthony Scaramucci, and media personalities like sex therapist Esther Perel. Once again, the name of the show is Recode Decode, hosted by me, Kara Swisher. You can find it on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this show. See you there.